Good evening, everyone, and a very Merry Christmas to you all. Welcome to radio station XMAS and our special holiday broadcast in front of a live audience of A Christmas Carol. This evening's performance is sponsored by the Better Butter Bureau, Spam, the questionable ham in a can, and the Clorox Council, germs face defeat when they're slathered in bleach, and America's national treasure, turpentine. <laughs> because this is a live broadcast, I want to ask our studio audience to take a moment to silence their cell phones, whatever that may be, and avoid eating loud snacks, <laughs> such as celery, dry cereal, or ribbon candy during our performance. Thank you. And we are on the air in five, four, three. Jacob Marley was dead to begin with. Oh, there's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, and the undertaker. And Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, yes, old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were business partners for, I don't know how many years. Uh, Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Scrooge had never painted out old Marley's sign in his name above their business sign. There it stood years afterwards, Scrooge and Marley. <laughs> oh, but he was tight-fisted, Scrooge. No warmth could warm him, no wintry weather chill him. Hard and sharp as flint, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say, oh, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? Even the blind man's dogs appeared to know him. And when they saw him coming, would tug their owners into doorways and up alleys. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Old Scrooge suffered not only from monetary miserliness, but a dire miserliness of the human spirit as well. Our story begins on a cold, snow-swept London street, crowded with merchants, deliverymen, steaming horses, and package-laden citizens, all rushing to and fro to be done and home before Christmas Eve becomes Christmas Day. Over the door of a decaying wood building, a faded sign creaks in the wind. It reads, Ebenezer Scrooge and Jacob Marley, brokers. The cramped, musty interior of this establishment is lit only by two candles and the dying glow of a few coal embers in the stove. The only sounds are the scratching of Bob Cratchit's quill and the ticking of a clock. The front door quietly opens and closes. Scrooge's nephew Fred enters silently, removes his top hat, and places a finger to his lips. Shh! He winks at Bob Cratchit and tip toes down the hall to Scrooge's back office and stands unnoticed behind Scrooge's desk. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Bah, humbug! Christmas a humbug? Uncle, you don't mean that, I am sure. Oh, I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come then. What right have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. Hmm. Humbug. Oh, don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in a world of fools? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without any money? A time for balancing your books and having every item in them set dead against you. No, if I could work my will, every idiot who goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mind. Keep it? 
Oh, but you don't keep it. Well, let me leave it alone then. Oh, much good it has done for you. Much good is it, it has ever done for you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. But I've always thought of Christmas as, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of when men and women consent to open up their shut-up hearts freely. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless you. <laughs> oh, you are quite a powerful speaker, sir. You should go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come, uh, dine with us tomorrow. Never, nephew, never. But why? 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 Why did you get married against my wishes to a dollarless girl? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. Uncle Ebenezer, you never came to see me before I was married. You never met my good wife, Claire. And you have a lovely grandniece. Good afternoon. Uncle, I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute, but I have made my homage to Christmas, and every Yuletide I will petition you, as I have now, to join your only family. So, Merry Christmas, Uncle, and a Happy New Year. That said, Fred turned and made his way down the dark corridor. Scrooge watched him stop at Cratchit's desk, heard them wish each other the best of good tidings, and then Fred wrapped his red muffler around his neck, fixed his hat upon his brow, and went out into the snowy street. Cratchit breathed a sigh of relief as the last chime diminished and said, Oh, finally. After what seemed an eternity, he heard the scraping of Scrooge's chair. Closing his letter, he rose from his stool, rushed to the coat rack, unhooked Scrooge's black coat, and held it ready. Without a word, Scrooge slipped into his coat, pulled his scarf from Cratchit's cold hands, then his hat, and lastly, his ivory-handled cane. With one hand on the door latch, Scrooge half turned to Bob Cratchit. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose? Oh, oh yeah, quite convenient, sir. Well, it's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I were to charge you half a crown <coughs> for the day, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. No, no. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay you a day's wages for no work. Uh, uh, but, 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 sir, it's only once a year. Oh, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. Oh, I, I, I promise that I will, yes, sir. You will. Uh, and Mary, uh, oh, Mary had a little lamb. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Scrooge sighed, shook his head, lifted the door's latch, and stepped out into the streets, muttering to himself about sending Cratchit to an asylum. As he put on his gloves, he noticed three women, elegantly dressed with colorful velvet capes and matching bonnets. One, a stout woman, held a small ledger in her gloved hands. The other two, their hands tucked into ermine muffs. The stout woman gazed at the faded sign, then smiling, addressed Scrooge. Oh, a Scrooge and Marlis, I believe. Have we the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. Oh. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh. We have no doubt his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner. Ooh, at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. 
Are there no prisons? Oh, plenty of prisons. <laughs> and the workhouses, they are still in operation? Oh, they are. I wish I could say they were not, but they are. <laughs> Good. I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. I'm glad to hear that that is not the case. So let them go there. Oh, what? Mr. Scrooge, yes. those institutions scarcely furnish cheer to the mind or body. Thus, we are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and some means of warmth. Mm. We choose this time of year because it is a time, above all others, when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall we put you down for? <laughs> oh, nothing. Oh, you wish to remain anonymous. Oh. I wish to be left alone. So oh. you ask me what I wish, ladies, here is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help support the establishments that I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Well, but, but many can't go there, and many would rather die. Oh, if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh. Besides, they are not my business. It's enough for a man to know his own business and not interfere in other people's mind, uh, ladies. Occupies me constantly. Oh, for shame! Oh, rough! Scrooge waved his cane to and fro, forcing the ladies back. Then, smiling, he briskly walked his way down the crooked lanes toward his house. But before we continue with our story, it's time for a commercial. <laughs> It's Christmas time, and you're in a jam. If you can't afford a turkey, then reach for the bright blue can and cart your turkey out of Spam. That's right, folks. Spam's congealed meaty goodness can be sculpted into miniature pink turkeys. No more fighting over who gets the leg or breast. Instead, each member of your family gets their own bird. Don't worry about taste. Spam's special formula makes all Spam taste more like meat than meat. Mm. So good. And for Easter, carve a roast leg of Spam. Serve all juice. Pair with Manischewitz Conquered Grape Wine. Mmm, delicious. A large gray house sits back from the street. Ribbons of fog dip and swirl around its dark exterior. Dark, that is, except for one dusty upstairs window where two faint shadows move across the ceiling. This is Scrooge's house, bequeathed to him by Jacob Marley. Two maids, Mrs. Dilber and Mrs. Buttwinker, are preparing the bedroom chamber, the only room in the great house that Scrooge chooses to occupy. We best hurry along, himself will be home soon. Now don't put any more coals in the hearth, Mrs. B. He counts them like there was gold. No more than five pieces. I'm doing the best I can, dearie. You could heat this room till the devil says enough. And it would warm that old skin flint's heart. Look at us, we are in our coats to do our work. I'm glad he only lives in this one room. I and only allowing one candle to see what we're doing here. At least that lets us move the dirt from one dark corner to the other. <laughs> and he's never the wiser for it. <laughs> He'll be here soon, so let's do our checklist. Pillows fluffed and bed curtains opened. I, oh, I do love those oh, curtains. Yes. Robe and nightcap on bed. Aye, and the floor dust has been swept into the dark north corner of the room. Uh, and the special biscuits I made for him is next to his ratty old chair. <laughs> and why would you be doing that, Mrs. B? It's Christmas, ain't it? <laughs> He'll ask, what's this for? And we'll say, Everyone gets a little something at Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. It's a gift for you, from us. 
and we'll stick it in our hands and it'll give us a tip. <laughs> the tip of his cane on our backside is his idea of a tip. Either way, he's not going to refuse me biscuits. They're made with sugar and flour mm -hmm. and sawdust and butter <laughs> and red currants and um, yeah. rabbit mm. raisins. <laughs> <laughs> You hang up his coat and scarf. I'll take the hat and cane. <clears throat> good evening, sir. What's good about it? What's Butt Winker doing here? This isn't her work day. Oh, uh, sir, uh, her mother died um, this morning, and the funeral is Wednesday, and uh, well, Wednesday is her work day, so I thought she could help me today, and I'd do her Wednesday. <laughs> You did, did you? Well, let me tell you both something about funerals. You die, you're put in a box, dropped in a hole, someone mumbles something, they fill in the hole, and it doesn't take all day, but Winker, I expect you to be here on Wednesday or else, all right? What, what about your head? Why are your hands out like that? Is there, is there, is there a, a leak in the ceiling? Um, we're, we're pointing out the b b b b b biscuits, uh, ain't we, Ben? Oh, yeah. b b b b b b biscuits? Uh, 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 next to your chair, sir. Everyone gets a little something at Christmas. <laughs> oh. Well, you're right, you're, yes, you're right, Buttwinker. So, there's one for you oh. and one for you. Now, go away and leave me be. Oh. And I expect you to be here first thing in the morning, Delba. But, but sir, tomorrow is Christmas Day. It's a holiday. It's a, it's a celebration. Then celebrate by eating your b b, -b biscuit. I expect you here first thing in the morning and make sure your mother doesn't die before then. Now out, out, both of you. Scrooge went to the chamber door and secured two large door latches. But why? To keep out what? Hobgoblins? Vengeful maids? Christmas? Then he undressed, put on his nightshirt, struggled into his robe, affixed his nightcap, and settled into the chair in front of his humble fire. Tentatively, he took one of the remaining biscuits, examined it, then bit into it. Black sugar. Mm. Then he took a second bite. Definitely black sugar. But suddenly, the chamber became incredibly cold. Mm. A wind from an unsourced, unseen source Ooh. set the dying cold and was light. Scrooge leapt from his chair, Ooh. trembling, and with eyes wide, faced the chamber door. Ooh. He watched the latches unbolt themselves Ooh. one by one. Ooh. Suddenly, the door burst there. Scrooge, mouth the gate, beheld a specter. It was whole, and yet not whole. The spectre advanced toward him, its tattered form slowed in its progress by massive chains and weights. Sour currant in a biscuit of a biscuit. There's no more of gravy than of grave about you, whoever you are, so I say, humbug! I tell you, humbug! No! <laughs> 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 I say, mercy, I beg you, 
lovely, dreadful apparition, mercy. Why do you trouble me? Man of the world's in mind. Do you believe in me? Oh, no. Oh, I, I, I do, I do, I do, I do. I must. But, but, but uh, Jacob, why, why does your spirit walk the earth? And why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk among his fellow man and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I am doomed to wander through the world and witness what I cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turned to happiness. <laughs> Wrapped in chains and weighted cash boxes. You tell me why. I wear the chains I forged in life and made them link by link and yard by yard. Is their pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and link of the chains you wear yourself? They were as full and as heavy and as long as mine. Seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on them since. Oh, they are ponderous chains. Jacob. <laughs> oh, Jacob, Molly, speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give. <laughs> A very little more is all that is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. Mark me, Ebenezer Scrooge. In life, I never rove beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. <laughs> but you are always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Y yes. Mankind was my business. At this time of the rolling year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of my fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raise them to that blessed star that led the wise men to that poor abode? Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. hear me, Ebenezer Scrooge. My time is nearly gone. Ebenezer, I am here tonight to tell you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring. <laughs> you are always a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> you will be haunted by three spirits on three nights. Uh, is that the chance and hope you had mentioned, Jacob? It is. Uh, I think I'd rather not. No, 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 not at all. Without their visits, Ebenezer, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first when the bell tolls one. I, I couldn't I take them all at once? And then I expect the second, <laughs> then the third to follow. When the last stroke of three ceases to vibrate. Oh! Oh! Ah, 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 oh! Look to see me no more! Ah! 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 Shudder returned to himself. He ran to the door, rebolted it, shuffled quickly to his bed, and pulled the bed curtains close around him. Oh, he shivered under the covers and awaited the chiming of the hour. Within moments, however, <coughs> Scrooge had fallen into a deep welcome sleep. And now, while Scrooge sleeps, we'll hear from our next sponsor. The Better Butter Bureau. Why, thank you, Carl. Lorna Holstein here. This portion of our show is blissfully brought to you by the Better Butter Bureau. Ladies, churn dark days into sunshine by slathering 
anything edible with the golden goodness of butter. Now, here's your nutrition tip for today. Feed your family a cup of hot butter. It helps lubricate their arteries and their veins. <laughs> and for naughty butterlicious fun, freeze pats of butter rock hard, serve them to your in-laws, and enjoy their frustration as they try to spread it on Wonder Bread. <laughs> so, give them all a little pat of butter. And remember, ladies, it's not butter if it doesn't come from the udder. No. No. <laughs> no. Scrooge awoke from his deep sleep with a start and sat bolt upright, frozen in the inky dark, listening. The only sound he heard was the fierce beating of his heart. <laughs> ah, nothing! Humbug! <laughs> he was about to settle back down when the bed curtain suddenly <laughs> flew open and a light momentarily brighter than the sun filled the room, then slowly diminished to a pulsating glow that shimmered like the aurora around the figure now before him. It had the body of an adult, and yet its countenance was that of a sweet child. Its hair was long, white, and it flowed and danced from side to side. And it flowed more and was whipped by an unknown wind. Scrooge, wide-eyed and seemingly spellbound, addressed the unearthly vision before him. Are you the spirit who was foretold to me? I am. Oh, what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Uh, spirit, I have no intention to offend. Uh, but what business do you have with me? I want you to sleep. Your welfare. <laughs> spirit, I am much obliged, but I cannot think but a night of unbroken rest would be better for my welfare, so I just... Uh, your reclamation, then. Scrooge, rise. Touch my hand and walk with me. Scrooge reluctantly rose and extended a shaking hand. The spirit's mm -hmm. touch was that of a gentle woman's. And once attached, he felt like uh, a child again. <laughs> he also balked like one when he saw she was guiding him toward his now open second floor window. No, 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 no. I, I'm a mortal and alive to fall. <coughs> the spirit turned, placed her other hand on his heart. Fear not, Ebenezer, for you shall be upheld in more than this. Scrooge closed his eyes and felt only the gentle tug of her hand as they passed through the wall. <laughs> when he opened his eyes, he was dumbstruck by the surroundings, for he was outdoors on the crest of a hill, overlooking a large gray stone building. He was still in his night clothes, standing in a snow-covered lane. But Scrooge felt neither cold nor wet. <laughs> Good heavens, I, I was schooled in this place. I was a student here. And there is my old school itself. These are shadows of things that have been. They have no awareness of us. It seems so deserted. It's Christmas time, and everyone has left for the holidays. Scrooge closed his eyes and emitted a deep sigh. <laughs> When he opened them, he found himself inside a cavernous study hall with row upon row of tables with their chairs inverted atop them. All that is, except for one chair, turned towards the great hearth. In it sat a young boy quite alone, reading. This is where your father made you spend many a Christmas alone while all your classmates were celebrating at home. I know, I know. <sighs> Take heed, Ebenezer. Oh, brother. Fed, 
Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother, to bring you home, home, home. Home, little fair. Oh, yes, home for good, home forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. He spoke to me so gently one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to never come back here, dear brother. We're to be together all Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. Oh, you are quite the woman, little fan. Oh, yes, home, home. Oh, I'll happily go with you, little sister. Is, is that a tear upon your cheek, Scrooge? No, it is nothing. Fan was always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. But she had a strong heart. So she had. She died a woman and had, I think, children. Uh, one child, his name is Fred, uh, my nephew Fred. Mm. His first breath became her last breath, my dear Fan. Dear Fan. Such was the fate of your own mother. She also died giving you life. A theft of life for which your father had blamed you for many years. Let us move on to the time when you were young, when you were a young man. Close your eyes. Scrooge reluctantly <coughs> obeyed and felt the spirit take his hand. He also felt a tugging against mm. himself, as if he were passing through a, a thick ether. Mm. He soon found himself standing inside the entrance of a large wooden warehouse. The floor had been cleared and was swept clean. Workers, male and female, were dressing a large banquet table with holly and candles. The table seemed to sag from the weight of roasts, kegs of beer, punch bowls, and many cheeses. On one side, near the front entrance, a row of high-top desks was occupied by a bevy of clerks. Do you know this place? <laughs> know it? I was apprenticed here at Mr. Fezziwig's. Scrooge oh. stared in awe at one of the lads seated at a desk, for it was Scrooge himself as a handsome and fit young man, seemingly happy in his work. From an office emerged two men, one a young man around Scrooge's age, the other a portly older man, whose smile and bulging waistcoat herald a life well lived. It's Fezziwig! Oh, bless his heart, it's old Fezziwig alive again! <laughs> Hilly ho, everyone! <laughs> oh, no more work tonight! Hilly ho, it's Christmas Eve! <laughs> Ebenezer, lads, clear your desks to the side of the room before they're tumbled into splinters by our dancing. Ah, hilly ho, open the doors and let our guests enter. The doors swung open. A bow-legged fiddler was the first to come through, already playing his fiddle, which sounded like 50 stomach aches. <laughs> Led by the plump and smiling Mrs. Fezziwig, <laughs> a boisterous gaggle of employees, families, children, and guests poured into the welcoming space. Among them, a dainty young beauty named Belle, whose slender figure later this evening would support a modest ring pledged to her by an adoring Ebenezer Scrooge. Yo ho there, Ebenezer! I, I want you to meet our new apprentice, young Jacob Marley. He'll be working with you, Ebenezer. You two boys, take a moment to get acquainted while I go retrieve Mrs. Bessie Wig away from the punch bowl before she gets punched by the punch. <laughs> Hilly ho, everyone! Welcome! <laughs> Are you a good worker, Mr. Marley? Oh, oh, I work hard, Ebenezer, very hard. I wish to pursue the changing world of finance. There's money to be made in this new era of industry. It will belong to the shrewd financier. I want to touch money, Mr. Scrooge, not a shovel. You do understand the opportunities I speak of, don't you, sir? I, 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 Jacob, but I do. Well, I feel that we may have much in common, Ebenezer. 
let us talk after the holiday. But now, I'm off to see if there is any punch in uh, Fezziwig's punch. Uh, Merry Christmas, Ebenezer. <laughs> and Merry Christmas, Jacob. I, I look forward to hearing more about your plans. Oh, but now it's Christmas. Belle, Belle, are you ready to dance? <laughs> oh, spirit, I, I, I feel as though if I, I'm out of my wits, my, my heart and soul are in this place. What memories, <coughs> oh, how I enjoyed everything. Oh, Fezziwig. Ah, uh, the happiness he gave is quite as good as if it cost a fortune. We were so full of happiness and gratitude. And yet, what did it cost? A pittance, nothing. Well, what should we do? Oh, poor old Fizzy with it. Oh, ghost, I, I, I feel the most horrible agitation in my heart. Perhaps it's the memory <coughs> that in later years, you and your worldly business partner, Marley, forced dear old Fezziwig out of his business for a fraction of its true value. Mm -hmm. Jesus, that's why you know. My time grows short. Close your eyes. Scrooge squeezed his eyes closed and bowed his head, chastened by this, this painful memory. When he opened them, he found himself seated on a bench in a rose garden. The fiddle tunes of Christmas now replaced by the sounds of spring. Across from him sat a somewhat older belle. Her brow was furrowed, a handkerchief twisted in her fingers. Scrooge, now a man in his prime, whose countenance began to wear the signs of avarice. Oh, there was a greedy, restless motion in his eyes that exposed the passion that had taken root within him. As Scrooge sat next to Belle, his gaze avoided her tear-stained face. Ebenezer, I must speak frankly and from my heart. Another idol has displaced me. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. There's nothing the world condemns with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. But, dear Belle, there is nothing, nothing so grave as poverty. You fear the world too much, Ebenezer. I've grown wiser, but I, I am not changed toward you, am I? Ebenezer, our engagement is now an old one. It was made when we were both poor and, I thought, content to be so until we could improve our fortunes by our patient industry. When our engagement was made, you were another man, but that is true no longer, and I now release you. If you were free today, can I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who weigh everything by gain? Here, take this ring that I have worn these years with patient hope. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Spirit! Remove me from this place, I cannot bear it. I told you that these were shadows of things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Leave me and haunt me no longer. And so the ghost did by glowing as bright as the sun, forcing Scrooge to cover his eyes in the dark crook of his arm. And in that dark, he felt himself falling in a most unpleasant descent. He flailed for support and grasped the darkness itself until the falling stopped. How can that be, he thought. Then opening his eyes, found himself sitting up in his own bed, his hands gripping the curtain. With relief, Scrooge fell back onto his pillow and... Uh... Scrooge! Ebenezer Scrooge! <laughs> Come forward and know me better, man! Scrooge peeked through his bed curtains and saw a light fanning out from beneath his chamber door. He arose, shuffled across the room, and unlatched the door. And into the doorway of what had been a vacant room. Oh, he could only stare at the incomprehensibility of what was before him. The once dank walls were now decorated with holly and ivy. Heaped upon the floor were cooked turkeys, suckling pigs, and platters of roast, 
Steaming plum pudding and hot bowls of punch were everywhere. Atop this mountain of food sat a jolly giant wrapped in a long green robe trimmed in white fur. He had a full red beard with crimson locks, and the entire panorama was lit by a golden torch he held aloft. Come in, look upon me. Ha, you have never seen the likes of me before. <laughs> never, and I wish it had definitely the best postponed. But if tonight you have something to show me or teach me, let me profit by it. Oh, spirit, conduct me where you will. Touch the sleeve of my robe. Oh, not again. Reaching over a brace of quail and a pile of sausages. Scrooge touched him, and when he released it, found himself standing in a narrow street in front of a low-roof stucco house with only a small front window and a well-worn plank door. Whose ill-fitting house is this? Your clerks. Look through their window and watch and listen as they sit for their Christmas meal, such as it is. Remember, you are unseen and unheard by all but me. How did our little Tim behave in church? Oh, well, as good as gold and better. He told me, coming home, that he hoped people saw him because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Tiny Tim is growing strong and hearty, isn't he, my dear? Yes, 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 of course he is. Peter, Martha, Belinda, Tim, come to the table before the goose gets cold. Oh, 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 Father, there never was such a goose. Goose? Ah, spirit, I've seen pox chickens larger than that. We won't be able to finish it. It is so plentiful. So true, Martha. Now, take up your mugs. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. Bless, bless us. us. God bless us, everyone. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, 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 kind spirit. Say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, what then? Uh, if he, he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Man, will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. This delicious punch requires another toast. Mr. Scrooge, I give you Mr. Scrooge, the, the founder of the feast. <laughs> Founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon. My dear, Christmas Day, the, the children. I'll drink to his health for your sake and the day's, not for his. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. To Mr. Scrooge. We'll leave the Cratchits to enjoy their punch and bring one Woodwax to the microphone to tell us what the Turpentine Council is recommending this holiday season. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Friends, do you suffer from gout, hairy warts, black lung, or bubonic plague? Are you tired of your children having croup, whooping cough, measles, mumps, appendicitis, bronchitis, or the vapors? Did you know that turpentine, administered properly, fights infection, removes all kinds of anything from your skin, and will freshen your breath like nothing you've ever tried? Ah, ah turpentine! <laughs> Scrooge lingered at the Cratchit's window, watching the family during their hum humble celebration. And the ghost of Christmas present gave him a now familiar command. Touch my robe. Scrooge soon found himself in the inviting parlor of a home he had never seen before. It was his nephew Fred's, 
they were having after dinner sherry with their guests. <laughs> but he said that Christmas was a humbug, and he believes it too. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Well, I do, Fred. He didn't come to our wedding. He's never met his only niece, and you keep asking him to come here. And what do you get for an answer? Humbug! <laughs> <laughs> here he takes it into his head to dislike us. But what's the consequence? Well, he don't get lose much of a dinner. Oh, Fred! I think he loses a very good dinner. Oh, indeed he does, my love. None better. Now let us play, uh, yes and no. Oh, spirit, spirit, I know this game. I want to play too. Remember, they can't see nor hear you. You all know how to play. The category is live animals. Oh, uh, is it a disagreeable animal? Oh, yes. Oh, uh, does it growl and grunt sometimes? Yes. Oh, oh is it a bear? Uh, no. Oh, a, a tiger? No. Oh, is it an ass? Oh. <laughs> mm, uh, no. Uh, oh, I know what it is, everyone. What? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Fred's Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> given us plenty of merriment as well as disappointment. But it would be ungrateful for me not to drink to his health. So I say Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to Uncle Scrooge. To Uncle, Uncle Scrooge. Scrooge. A downcast Scrooge did not have to be prompted by the spirit. He closed his eyes, touched the ghost's robe, and soon felt the robe slip from his grasp as he stumbled to his knees onto the frozen earth. Scrooge found himself in a snow-encrusted field on the outskirts of town. He beheld the spirit some distance away, a low fog dancing around his feet, his red beard now as white as the surrounding snow, and the flame of his torch slowly dimming. Spirit, it has been a long night, if only a night. How can it be in it? It is strange, too, spirit, that you grow older. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Hark! The time is drawing nigh. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange coming out of the mist that surrounds you. Is that a foot or a cloth? Ah, it might be a claw for the flesh that is upon it. Look here, observe these children. Mm. The parting fog revealed two emaciated children, their tattered rags barely covering their skeletal features, their eyes feral and piercing. Scrooge recoils. The spirit out of yours? They are man's, and they cling to me. This frightful boy is ignorant. This wretched girl is want. Beware of them both, and of all their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written, which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Have they, have they no refuge or resource? Uh, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? <laughs> Scrooge, upon hearing his own words cast upon him, fell to the ground, covering his ears. Thus he remained until the echo of his callous words left him. As Scrooge arose, a, a heart freezing chill passed through him, turning. His eyes widened as he observed a, a phantom floating through the mist towards him. Its dark robe and hood exposing nothing except a pale hand point a, pointing a long, bony finger at him. I, I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me the shadows of things that have not happened but will happen in the time before us? Is that so, spirit? 
ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and I hope to become another man from what I was, I will bear your company and, and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Will. Then lead on, spirit. I feel that the night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me. The phantom passed its bloodless hand over Scrooge's eyes, and suddenly he found himself in a dark corner of the Cratchit house. He observed the Cratchit family, less Bob and Tiny Tim, seated on the floor surrounded Mrs. Cratchit, who, with a Bible on her lap, stared with the others into the dwindling fire. Father seems to be walking a little slower these days, Mother. Oh, I've known him to walk very fast with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. But then he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. Oh, Father. father. Oh, I, I'm a little late, my dears. Uh, please forgive me. Oh, Robert, you must be cold and tired. Sit no, by the fire. No, no, I, I, I'm very content, my dear. Very content. I wait to see the place where Tim will rest. It's sheltered by trees, and it's very quiet and still. It was strange, but as I stood there, I felt his hand slip into mine, as if he was sitting beside me and comforting me. He was telling me in his own way that he is happy, truly happy, and that we must cease to grieve for him and try to be happy too. Oh, Tim, my sweet Tim. Scrooge clutched at his heart, not since the death of his beloved sister, Fan. Had he known an agony such as he felt at that moment? But in an instant, the spectre brought Scrooge to an obscure part of London. The ways were dark and narrow, occupied by the drunken and desperate. Ugly alleys and gutters disgorged their offensive smells of both the living and the dead. It was under a low, collapsed roof at the end of an alley that the phantom had Scrooge halt. Through the smoke, hanging chains, and stacks of rusty iron sat old Joe, the bent, gnarled odor of the piles of surrounding debris. Soon, two shadowy forms wove through its cramped quarters, each carrying large bundles. Ah! Ha 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 ha! Ah, me lovelies! Come into me parlor and gather round me fair beauties. Let old Joe see your, <laughs> your treasures. No, you ain't so old, Joe. Here, look into me bundle, Joe. Yeah. I want to know the value of me goods. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Mm. <laughs> Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, thou wicked old screw. He'd have had somebody looking in on him when he was struck with death. Instead of lying there, gasping out his last breath, alone by himself. It's the truest word that was ever spoke. It's a judgment on him. Mm. It's time, Joe. Let me know the value of me treasures. Speak out plain. Well, uh, let me see what's here. A pencil case, a, a pair of sleeve buttons, a porridge bowl and spoon. Oh, still crusted, I see. Oh, uh, a pair of sugar tongs, a no sugar bowl. And what's this? A boot? Where's its mate? Ah, never mind. I know a one-legged fellow would give his leg to own it. <laughs> Let's see, here's three shillings, six pence, what? Uh, and that's your no, account, and no, I no, wouldn't no, give another no. si uh, shh. Uh, I wouldn't give another six pence if I was to be boiled in oil. I always give too much to the ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruined myself. <laughs> So, Joe, it ain't any That's your account! 
You ask me for another penny, I'll repent of me ah. too, liberal and not off half. Who's next? And now, my bundle, Joe. <laughs> oh, what do you call this? Bed curtains? Aye. You don't mind to say you took them down, rings and all, with, with him lying there. Aye, I do. And never <laughs> even blinked when I did so. <laughs> Woman, you were born to make your fortune, <laughs> and you'll certainly do it. Oh. Are these his blankets? Who else's do you think? He ain't likely to take cold without me, I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he didn't die of anything catching. Uh, oh. What's this? A nightshirt? Oh, yeah. oh, woman, don't tell me you took off his night. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you mean, wasted it? I mean, I buried it in minutes. <laughs> That's what. I took it off him and gave him uh. an old calico one. He didn't seem to mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he frightened everyone when he was alive. To profit us when he was dead. Eh? <laughs> Here, Joe, have a biscuit. <laughs> While old Joe enjoys his biscuit, we'll enjoy a word from another one of our sponsors. Clorox toothpaste. Oh. And Miss Hannah Hollybush. Oil your teeth with refreshing Clorox toothpaste. <laughs> Clorox toothpaste keeps tartar and anything else from forming. The secret of its wonderful cleansing power is the hydrochloric acid, the OX in Clorox toothpaste. It dissolves with water and cleans out the space between teeth that even a dentist drill can't penetrate. <laughs> Keep a second tube in the laundry. A bit of squirt will take out stubborn stains. Look for the smiling ox on the tube. Thank you, Miss Anna Holliday. <laughs> and now, the last chapter of A Christmas Carol. Realizing there was something unusually familiar about the transaction that he had just witnessed, Scrooge petitioned the phantom to remove him from the vile surroundings. In a blinding instant, Scrooge found himself under the stone arch of a cemetery en entrance. A forest of gravestones lay before him. The dark phantom gestured for Scrooge to come forward, while his other skeletal finger pointed to a particular stone draped in black cloth. Tearful and shaking, Scrooge approached the covered tablet. Before I remove the shroud from this cold stone, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be only? <laughs> Here, Miss Spirit, and the men's past actions will force shadows certain ends to which, if persevere, they must lead you. But, but if their actions be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Scrooge, pull the cloth from the stone. <laughs> and read the inscribed name. <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> no, 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 Scrooge, no. No, hear, hear me, hear me. I, I, I'm, I'm not the man I was. I will, I will not be the man I must have been. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Assure me that I may yet change these shadows I have been shown this night by an altered life. I will live in the past, in the present, and the future. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, please, Spirit, tell me I may wipe away the writing on the stone. Please, I beg you, I am not the man I was. I am not the man I was. I am not the man I was. Hey, 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 hey. What? This is not the cover on my headstone. This is, this is my bed curtains. <laughs> and, and this is my bedroom. With blessed daylight streaming through my window. Thank you, Jacob, Mommy. I say it on my knees, Jacob. Heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. <laughs> Oh, I, I, 
I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I, I, I'm as light as a feather. I, I, I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as giddy as a schoolboy. <laughs> oh, as cheery as a drunken man. <laughs> well, it's, it's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> oh, who could this be? Maybe Christmas present is returning with some sausages. Coming Christmas present. Good morning, sir. Oh, it's you, Dilma. Well, well, come in, come in, come in. in. Uh, Dilma, tell me, what day is it? Why, it's Christmas Day, of course, sir. Oh, then I haven't missed it. <laughs> the spirits must have done everything in one night. Well, of course they can do the spirits. <laughs> uh, are you quite yourself, <laughs> sir? Uh, uh, what? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't think so. I hope not. <laughs> Look, Dilma, my bed curtains are still here. You didn't take them. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're not cheery yeah. enough anyway. You can tell them, Bill. Merry Christmas. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, I don't know what time of day it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. Well, I never did know anything, but I know that I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Oh, I don't know anything. I don't. Mrs. Dilma, how about a Christmas hug? No, 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 please, Mrs. Dilma, stop running around. I'm not mad. No, I'll scream. <laughs> Mrs. Dober, wait, wait, wait. It's here in my robe pocket. Ah, here it is. For you, Mrs. Dober. <gasps> What's this coin for? To keep me mouth shut. Ah, no, 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 Mrs. Dober. It's a Christmas present. A Christmas present? For me? For you? From me. Merry, merry Christmas. Uh, yeah. uh, how much do I pay you? Four shillings a week. Oh, well, no, it's okay. Well, now it will be ten shillings. Oh, sir. Are you sure you don't want to see a doctor? Well, certainly not, nor an undertaker either. Now, no work for you on Christmas Day. Go and buy yourself some gin or something, and then go home and make some of those delicious b -b -b biscuits that you make. <laughs> oh, Mr. Scrooge, bless you. Merry Christmas, <laughs> in keeping with the situation. <laughs> <laughs> Situa situation? What situation? Oh, oh I might let some fresh air into this room of gloom. Oh, glorious, 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 glorious. Oh, hello, boy. Uh, so, me? Yes, yes, you. Uh, do you know the market in the next street on the corner? I should hope I do. Oh, an intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. <laughs> Lad, do you know if they sold the prize turkey that was hanging there? What? The one as big as me? <laughs> <laughs> well, delightful boy, it's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. I'll take a walk. No, 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 no. <laughs> Cheap boy. I'm in earnest. Go and bring back the turkey, the grocer and his wagon, that I may give them the direction where to take it. Here's a shilling to get you going. Come back in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. Yes, sir. Whoa, look at him go, a natural athlete he is. I'll send it anonymously to the Cratchit. Twice the size of Tiny Tim. Ah. Later that morning, a sprightly, smiling Scrooge, wearing his best silk shirt and finery, tipped his hat to all he passed. When he arrived at his nephew's home, he sprang up the steps, took a deep breath, and gently knocked. When the door opened, he beheld for the first time ever the sweet face of a little girl. Scrooge bent down for a moment and studied her radiant innocence. He found himself choking back an unsolicited tear. And you are? My name is Fan. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Are you here to join us for Christmas? Oh, I hope so, dear Fan, for this one and many more. Hurrah! Uh, come on, I'll take you to the parlor. Papa, look! Uncle Scrooge! Oh, dear heart alive! To sigh, uh, will you let me in, Fred? Huh, of course, dear uncle. You are welcome, so very welcome. Merry Christmas to your nephew, and especially to you, Claire. Can you ever forgive a foolish old man? Of course, dear uncle. Come and join our guests. We're about to play a game called Yes and No. Do you know it? Oh, I know it very, very well. Yes, I do. Oh, they played happily for hours, <laughs> then feasted on a delicious dinner. 
during which Scrooge and Little Fan giggled and whispered to each other, so much so that Claire had to laughingly admonish them both. <laughs> it was late when Scrooge finally bid good night. That evening in his chamber, he slept a wonderfully deep and dreamless sleep. Early the next morning, Scrooge hummed his way along the sun-splashed streets to his office. Turning a corner, he spied the three ladies who had previously approached him for alms. He cornered them as they exited a tea shop. Uh, my dear lady, a uh, uh, good morning to you. Oh, it's Mr. Scrooge, ladies. Uh, 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 rough. Uh, yeah, yes, that is my name, and I fear I was exceedingly unpleasant to you. So. Allow me to apologize and contribute this. Oh! oh, 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 oh. Well, Lord bless us! Oh, Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? Oh, my dear sir, we don't know what to say to such generosity. I don't say anything, please. Oh. But do come and visit with me sometime soon, will you, ladies? Oh, oh we, we will! will. <laughs> oh, thank you, I am so much oh. obliged to you. Ta-ta! Oh, ta-ta! <laughs> Scrooge arrived at his office earlier than usual. He hurriedly lit candles, stoked the coal stove to the bursting point, and chuckling, sat behind his desk, waiting for Bob Cratchit, who he knew would be late. Cratchit! Come back here! What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I, I am very sorry, sir. It, it shall not be repeated. Uh, I was making rather too merry yesterday. It, it won't be repeated. <laughs> Humbug! You hear me? Humbug! I am not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. You give me no choice, Bob Cratchit. Uh, Therefore, I'm going to raise your salary. Uh, but, sir, I promise I'll... Wait. What did you just say? <laughs> I'm going to raise your salary. Oh, oh the look on your face. <laughs> uh, uh, I haven't taken leave of my senses, Bob. I have come to them. Uh, my goodness, I, I don't know what to say, sir. Are you sure you're all right? <laughs> Don't say a word, Bob. I've never felt better. Ah, oh, it is a gift to be alive. Heed me. From this moment on, I shall see that all your needs are met and joy fills your family and your home. Uh, I'd like, with your permission, to expend all effort in making Tiny Tim whole and healthy. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Well, uh, no sense <laughs> trying to get any work out of either of us today, so let's go to the Headless Goat and celebrate. <laughs> what, is, what, what is it that your son, Tiny Tim, always says? God bless us, everyone. Aye, God, God bless, bless us, us, everyone. everyone. <laughs> this concludes our XMAS annual presentation of A Christmas Carol. We wish to thank our sponsors, Spam, Turpentine, Clorox Toothpaste, and the Better Butter Bureau. On behalf of all of us at the station, thanks for listening and have a very Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, everyone!